Well, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, really quite an honor to be invited here. Um, a special thanks to Marzi and the organizers of the MIA talk and Juan, who really I uh, wouldn't be here without, and, and of course as well. Um, so real pleasure to be here. Quick intro about me. Uh, I'm Wolfgang Pernice, as Marzi just said. Uh, at Columbia, I'm in a group um, that's led by Dr. Michio Hirano. And what we try to do really is um, to do this thing we call precision medicine or personalized medicine. Uh, so we are a group that consists of clinicians and research scientists. And um, what we try to do is to, when we see a patient in the clinic, we try to understand this person's genetics. If it's a genetic disease, we try to translate our insights there into some sort of a model that we can study in the lab, hopefully gain some insights as to the mechanisms of what's going on with that condition, translate that into a drug and bring it back to the patient. Pretty easy, but unfortunately it doesn't really work very well, the cycle. And uh, a lot of my efforts are focused on fixing a particular roadblock in uh, that cycle, which is actually focused on diagnostics. Um, so that's what our group's trying to do. And uh, the tool that, or maybe one strategy that we are trying to introduce in order to overcome some of these roadblocks in this personalized medicine cycle is um, to identify phenotypes that we can um, uh, study in the lab in order to understand mechanisms of disease. And um, I want to right away sort of show the acknowledgement slide for, for everything that I'm going to show you here. I already mentioned Anne and uh, Juan here at the Broad. Michael has contributed a lot to, Michael Doran has contributed a lot to this project, to a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today. And um, before I uh, go into sort of the, the, the meat of the project, I want to give a little bit more context. Um, so we're going to talk about profiling, in particular, uh, morphological profiling. And the idea here is that we have um, maybe in a couple of different settings, maybe we, we want to conduct a genetic perturbation screen or some small molecule screen, or in our, in our case, we want to apply uh, our technique to precision diagnostics. And the idea is that we have some sort of method in order that allows us to measure sort of comprehensively uh, one particular domain of variation of a cell in this case. Um, we can uh, perturb these cells with, say, small molecules, and hopefully we'll find that some molecules have uh, particular effects so that we can identify um, them in this feature space. In our case, in the application I'm going to talk about most today, we're going to have patients that we have cells derived from, and we want to first understand whether there are any signatures that distinguish the categories, so patients that are healthy and patients that have a particular genetic condition from each other. And to discover these kinds of signals, these kinds of phenotypes is uh, sort of the object of, of um, our efforts. Um, the reason why we're particularly, why I'm particularly interested in precision diagnostics or uh, applying profiling for diagnostics is because in many rare diseases, which is the topic of our group, um, even though we have already discovered lots of different genes that cause certain disorders, such as, for example, Chakramary tooth disease and related disorders, which is a type of peripheral neuropathy or mitochondrial diseases, we already know 250 different genes here and 90 there. Um, the diagnostic yield, if we say we get a patient, a new patient of unknown background in the clinic, and we sequence that patient, we try to figure out what the condition is caused by, what the causative mutation is, then uh, we often are not as good as we would like to be. We're often at around 50% or so, which means despite having already identified so many genes, we still have to potentially identify more genes. And uh, unfortunately, the way we typically do this, or we try to do this, and this is sort of a diagram of our workflow. Okay, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. And, and also, sorry if, if um, you said this in the first minute. Um, does that mean that you do, in the previous slide, does that rate mean that you do have a diagnosis, um, but not a molecular one? So, so you, you're confident that it's EMP, but you don't know what the, the causal variant is, essentially. Exactly. We, we, we clinically determine sort of the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis, the presentation of this patient. Right. This patient presents with a peripheral neuropathy, uh, looks genetic based on um, the pedigree, for example. Right. And then we try to understand what is the variant that causes this disease, right? The genetic variant, the mutation. Yeah. Um, and that, that is the part that we typically fail on. Not okay. typically, I, but I, fail on too often. Okay. And, I, and that's typically, that, that would be either because it's, it's, they, they have a, a yet another gene that's not discovered as associated or uh, maybe a variant class that hasn't been uh, properly uh, characterized. 
Yeah. Exactly right. So I'm going to get into why identifying these these variants is hard okay, in thanks. our mind and practice, but that's exactly what it is. Right? We we look, we do the sequencing, we look at the list of known genes that we know are associated with the condition. We find there's no mutation in those genes, none that we can see at least. Right? Depending on what sequencing technology you use, it's maybe whole exome, then you don't see things that are in the other parts of the genome, and so we we fail to identify. The, the causative mutation. Um, typically, however, and that's what I'm gonna talk about now, um, when we do our whole exome sequencing or, or whole, whole, exome, whole genome sequencing, we, we do a couple of steps. We do variant filtering. So we get a bunch of variants and then we see whether, um, you know, based on enrichment statistics. So those variants that are in the healthy population are unlikely to be the cause of our mutation. We get a list of variants, we compare them to a healthy population. Well, that you know, most of them are already present in the healthy population, so we don't know which one is responsible. And we can filter the variants also based on segregation. So if we have a pedigree of the family, we can filter those then. However, after that, we typically still end up with too many unknown variants, variants of unknown significance, one of which may be the one that's causing the disease, but we don't know how to distinguish them. Um, then we can sort of get into prioritization. We can look at very different, various different bioinformatic tools, the expression, and pathogenicity scores, maybe we can analyze the structure of the protein and so on to gain a little more evidence. We can mine the literature, but in the end, independent of how we prioritize them, we still need to somehow test. We need to do an experiment to confirm that this variant, one variant of interest is actually causative for the disease. Um, in order to do that, we need to go into the lab and what we really need here is a phenotype. We need some sort of phenotype that is disease associated in a model system that we can query and perturb in the laboratory. And unfortunately those phenotypes where they may manifest for 10 different variants, we, we don't know a priori. And that means that that's this, this sort of process often just stalls because no lab is equipped to, uh, to you know, think about informatively about every candidate variant you may identify. Not every lab is uh, ready uh, and able to generate mouse models for 10 different candidate variants. Uh, and so oftentimes without having enough statistical information based on the genetics, uh, the process of identifying which variant is causative for a particular patient often just stops um, until we find a new variant, uh, a new family with the same variant. In order to circumvent that problem, uh, this is what sort of this profiling idea is about, is that in parallel to the exome and the genome data, we would collect some cells from these patients. And we would then try to figure out uh, whether we can identify some disease associated phenotypes in these cells. So in this particular case, we have a group of patient cells and, and control cells, and then we apply some sort of profiling technique. And that's, you can really think of it as, as any omics if you want, um, to identify then hopefully some signatures that would distinguish patients from controls. And the great thing is if you have that system set up, such a system that can produce these phenotypes, we then can use these potentially very abstract phenotypes as signals that describe um, the disease and then test uh, hypotheses against that. So for example, we could introduce the var candidate variant number two into our cells. Say we introduce it in control cells. We think in a dominant case that should cause the disease. We'll see whether in the cells, if we introduce the variant, this makes the cells, control cells look like the patient. There would be pretty strong evidence that this variant is responsible for this. Or we could we could remove the variant of interest from the patient cells and see whether that rescues the patient, the cells to control phenotype. So if, if we have a phenotype, we, we're good to go. We can do, we can test these variants sort of directly. We're not dependent on additional information to somehow emerge from the ether, if you will. Um, so that's the application. Of course, we can also we could also apply this for different perturbations. We could we could screen some drugs here. Maybe if we apply some drug to this patient number three to these cells, they start looking like control cells, which might be a nice way to identify drugs that do something about the mechanism. So that's the application. Unfortunately, many of the profiling techniques, many of the omics that we typically think about, are still pretty expensive. So, for example, if you wanted to do single cell RNA seq at the on a broad scale. That becomes pretty pricey for a lot of labs that might want to be involved in this kind of technique. But one thing that uh, one technique that's been really a, a pillar of biology for a long time is imaging. And um, I'm showing you here a, a, a micrograph of a fluorescent microscopy image of a hu primary human fibroblast that we collect with our imaging protocol. And what we're visualizing here is um, the mitochondrial reticulum in the cell. Then here we have the mitochondrial nucleoids, the DNA of the mitochondria that are in there. Um, mapping those on top of each other. Here we have the endolysosomal compartment and the ER. And the reason why I'm showing you these slides is 
to get the point across. And I know I don't have to make this point to many in the audience, but um, nevertheless, it's sort of useful to, to remind ourselves that there's a ton of information in these modern microscopy images. The information is pretty hard to extract. Like maybe, you know, our phenotype of interest is sort of the association, particular proximity of these lysosomes here to particular folds of the ER or some association between mitochondria and ER. It's very hard to manually engineer features um, to measure these kinds of things. And you have to more fundamentally think of what you want to measure there in order to engineer these kinds of features. Um, and uh, in order to get around that, um, we want to apply um, deep learning. One way uh, we can think about the power of deep learning in this kind of approach is, um, I, like to, I like this metaphor of faces. We as humans, we have evolved to look at each other's faces and we can, I can sort of tell by looking in the audience how excited you guys are about what I'm saying, right? I can sort of read it off, I, Anne is very excited. Um, I can read it off your face, right? Juan is smiling, great. How, how do I know this? I can't really put it into words, but I've, I've, I've evolved to do this pretty well. I have not evolved to look at microscopy images and understand whether this cell is particularly excited or whatever is going on with this cell, right? But there's probably a lot of micro expressions, if you will, in these images that we might be able to leverage in, in, in our scientific endeavors. And well, in order to access those, we might be able to learn them through some of these deep learning um, methodologies that we are all excited about. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the data set that we have, that we have created, that we have created in order to test this idea that we can potentially identify disease associated phenotypes from primary patient cells um, that we derive. So uh, our protocol, I'm a, I'm a little bit proud of this protocol because it's sort of cool, I think. Um, it's obviously inspired by cell painting, but it's a little different. Um, so we start as always with some sort of plate. We have now a 24 uh, well plate typically. We seed our cells and then we stain with various different stains. Many of them you will recognize, mitotracker, deep red and so on. We have in particular this Alexa 488 anti-mitochondrial DNA antibody because we're interested in mitochondrial diseases. This seems like an important thing to measure. Um, and then the, the way we acquire these images is actually on a dedicated spinning disk confocal microscope. So like a state-of-the-art system that really allows us to collect what in my cell biologist's mind is a high quality image. You know, something that you can probably not easily achieve with dedicated high content imaging systems where we collect uh, with a 60X 1.94 NA uh, objective oil immersion, and we really move from 60X field to 60X field. We have a system to identify first and sort of larger fields of view where the cells are, and then we direct with XYZ coordinates um, that we derive from these positions, our objective to these uh, positions, and we, we capture a high resolution image there, high mag magnification image there. We collect them in 3D, and we've sort of um, designed our acquisition system to be reasonably fast. We're now at about um, 16 seconds per image stack. Um, and so that means that we're collecting natively single cell images. And these images really look like this. This is a bit, uh, you know, enhanced to, to make it look nice for the presentation, but the content um, of these images is there. That's sort of what they look like. So natively single cell. Um, and then we feed these images uh, from various different uh, patients and, and disease categories. Uh, we feed them into a neural network. We train our neural network or CNN, if you will, um, on distinguishing the disease classes. And if that's possible, then you know, hopefully we have figured out how to learn disease associated phenotypes, how to learn to recognize those from, from these images. And then uh, we, you know, we get amazingly a confusion matrix that looks like this. And if you're not familiar with these genes on the left here, um, I can tell you that some of these are responsible for peripheral neuropathies. Others are responsible for mitochondrial DNA depletion syndromes, none of which have previously been shown to express any kind of morphological phenotype in fibroblasts that we get from primary patients. It's kind of, if you look at it from the biology perspective, it's a bit of a preposterous idea to look at fibroblasts or peripheral neuropathies and expect that there's some sort of phenotype there. Um, I can talk about why we think that's still reasonable to check that out, uh, maybe at the end of the talk. Um, my point here is, if this result were real, it would be phenomenal, because we would have shown that we can identify true disease-associated phenotypes and fibroblasts for diseases that usually affect only neurons and so on. It's kind of a bit crazy. And so how, yeah, go ahead. There's a question in the audience. Yeah, 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 I'm gonna get exactly to that. Um, so if you just see these kind of, this kind of confusion matrix, you may be confused as to what I'm actually showing you here. Um, 
And what I'm showing you here is, is a typical result of what you would see in other machine learning or computer vision projects where you have a data set, you, have a, you split that into training and validation, then you, you, know, you train your model on the training set, you evaluate on your validation, these are holdout images, then you see whether it works and phenomenally seems to work. Now, I think everybody in the audience should be very suspicious of this result and we need to sort of see what's underneath the hood. And um, one immediate thing that, that we did in order to understand this result a little better is as biologists, we are visual people typically. And we like, we like these kinds of things. We like UMAPs, we like clouds. And so what we're doing here is we took the feature embeddings of our model as we ran the training set through it. And we collected them. And when we calculated a UMAP from the high dimensional space and we plot that in 2D and then we overlay it with various different categories. So we here categorize, we color it by the classes that we're looking at here. And then on the right, we're coloring it well by the batches. And that's going to be a big topic of this talk. Um, what you can see is on the left, well, we are clustering our classes in, in little clusters, but the global structure of these embeddings are not dominated by the classes. Instead, if we look at the batches, we really see that the batches are dominating this, this feature space. It looks like we have sort of batch number, what is it, number five here, and then batch number five, all the images here are sort of subdivided in its respective classes. And then we have another batch, say this, this pink guy here that also you know, distinguishes groups, but we don't have a uniform embedding that just represents the variation across classes. We have some entanglement here. We seem to represent batches as well. Um, that's a big problem. Uh, the reason why that's a big problem is because we want to apply our technique not just to analyze images that we already have in our data set, but we don't want to train our classifier and, and run inference on new batches and new images and so on. And if our model is sort of overfit to the batches that we have in our original training data set, then we might get confusing results, right? Our, our image, our classifier may. There's a question from Marzi. Yeah, there's a question in the chat box asking that, uh, what is control here? And also what are batches? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get into what batches are in much more detail now. What control is, is basically uh, patient uh, fibroblasts that we derive from healthy individuals that don't have any of the disease categories that we're describing otherwise. Um, so it's a little different from other profiling approaches where you have a, an isogenic cell line and sort of your perturbation is drugs and then your control is something that you don't perturb or that you perturb with, say, only DMSO. Here we have individual cells that have different genetic backgrounds but are, are uh, uniform in the sense that they don't uh, have a disease associated with them. So that's a little different here. Um, so now what are batches? I want to give you much more information as to how we may end up with these batch effects and what these batch effects actually come from. So a little bit of background here is how we actually collect this data. And we've created this diagram to illustrate a couple of different things. So typically how we outline our plates is that we seed them uh, in our particular case in, in a particular way. We have replicates of disease categories of cells that correspond to particular disease categories. And we randomize the layout of how we seed them in this section that we have another part where we have replicates of the same cells, uh, but in a different sort of layout. And we acquire them in sections. So we collect all the images from this part of the plate first. And then at another time, we collect all the images from that part. That's sort of a logistical reason why we do it that way. Um, we then have replicate plates, which is the same cells, the same cells from the same patients in a different plate. And we collect that again at a different time. Uh, and then we have different series, which is um, the idea that we go back to the freezer, we get all our cells thawed again, we incubate them, we seed new plates, and then we acquire everything again. So that's a little different from the, the difference here in between these two plates, which is we already have our batch of cells, and then we split them into two different plates. The difference between this and the series is that we go, we do the entire sort of workflow again. And in addition to that, in this second series, we are missing the green uh, cell type. Uh, instead, we have a new cell type here. And the idea behind that is our plates have limited capacity. They only have 24 wells in this particular scenario, but we would like to assess many more cells than we can fit in this particular system into these plates. And so that means that not all the plates have the same number or the same layout um, as the other ones. So that's behind the data. That's behind the training data that we have. And then we have here our neural network. And as we saw that what we, what we get, if we train on, the, on recognizing the classes that we have isolated, highlighted here, um, we get this kind of representation in which um, we get you know, nice clustering by class, but sort of 
not uh, dominated by class. We have some sort of other entanglement. Um, and then the way we evaluated this, that's really how you know, most machine learning projects have been set up so far, especially in the real world, is that we have, as I said, a holdout data set. And in this case, we call this the validation data set. And uh, this validation data set is sampled, sort of stratified throughout all our wells in this case. Um, if you want to relate it to some machine learning te terminology, our wells, if you will, are sort of the, the minimal environment from which we sample. So we have lots of different wells, we have lots of different minimal environments or universes, how one likes to call them. Um, and that's what we sample from. And now if we sample, if we create our validation data set like this, then we actually satisfy one of the fundamental assumptions of machine learning, which is that our validation data set is IID, which is identically and independently distributed um, to our training data set. And so it's not super surprising that we do okay if there is some signal that allows us to do this. Um, and so, you know, we map our validation data set onto our representations and we find that they line up pretty well. But that is not what we are interested in, in the end. Um, we would like, excuse me, we would like to be able to take some new data, some new plate with, you know, that wasn't included in the training distribution and that potentially includes a couple of new cell types and run that through the same uh, algorithm, the same, the same feature extraction process, and then hopefully find that these things line up well with our representations too. But if they are confounded by batch effects, we cannot expect that that would happen. Um, we need to ensure that um, our representations are independent of batch effects that are invariant to any kind of statistical structure that the batch effects define in order to be hopeful that um, this sort of application works. And you, you can think about it in the real world too, you know, any, any, any uh, system that we wanna build, in the end, we would like to apply that to new situations, to new, um, uh, paradigms and to new data. If you have a self-driving car, you train it on some set, but you'll at some point drive your car and you'll encounter a new situation. You'll hope that your system generalizes there, right? And the same thing we need to achieve here. So um, how do we get there? Um, in the end, what we can we can we can think about here is that, well, I'm saying we want to we want to learn features that are invariant to batch but are representing um, our classes. And we can sort of relate this to um, uh, some some language, if you will, that has now been adopted in the machine or it's becoming adopted in the machine learning world a little more, which is that of causal inference. And so we can think about and draw out, uh, if you will, a causal graph here that describes how we would like to um, model our data, what we would like to achieve. We would like, we have here a couple of different uh, nodes. We have the phenotypes and we have some confounder that produces nuisance factors and we call this the batch effect that together manifest some image X. So you can think of this as the sort of the data generation process. We have some phenotype that defines how the image X looks. And we have some batch effect, as we noted, that defines how the image X looks too. And then from that, we want to predict a label. So hopefully X causes some, some label here. Unfortunately, this confounder um, produces a backdoor, if you will, um, so that our batches are actually correlated with the, the label Y. Um, now, what we know from causality literature is that ideally we would, you know, we are observing this, this uh, conditional distribution here, X of X condition on Y. And ideally we would, we would uh, ensure that this, um, this correlation is uh, identical to the causal uh, representation, the, the causal effect that is Y do X. So if we, if we set a particular X, we would hope that um, the Y is only dependent on this X. In particular, we would hope that um, y given x is actually independent of the batch. Um, normally, it's, it's however pretty difficult and in fact impossible in, in other data sets to, to estimate what this, could, this interventional distribution really looks like because we, we don't observe the nuisance factor. We don't know what this really is. If you, if you think about image, image net, you know, we have nuisance factors such as the camera angle that sort of define what an image particular, in particular looks like, but we don't have annotations as to, you know, this is an image that was collected from this angle with this camera and so on and so forth. So we don't observe these kinds of nuisance factors in, uh, directly. However, so in other case- repeat what do X means? Yeah, so do X is sort of this idea that we intervene on a particular uh, factor of X that, that we set X to a particular thing so that it is independent of the other uh, causal uh, influences here. So we, we just select X um, and we set it to a particular 
thing. And then we hope that that maps to Y and that causes Y ex exclusively. Um, Can you give a concrete example? Um, actually, it's it's a bit difficult to to give you a concrete example in this particular scenario because we wouldn't exactly know what the intervention here should look like. But one thing maybe that is helpful is okay. Let's say X is um, comes from a particular batch from from this batch up here, and then we would set X so that it comes from a different batch, and we hope that we independent of what X originally looked like that the label that was associated with, with X is still the same, that our model predicts uh, Y reliably from a particular X, independent of what we set X's component of the batch effect sort of to, if you will. Um, that, that sounds a little convoluted and sort of complicated, but um, I'm gonna give you lots of examples for, for how we relate this sort of ideas of causal inference to what we actually do um, in the real world. Um, now, the important thing is that in our scenario, uh, we actually observe batch or this nuisance factor um, a little bit explicitly. We actually know a lot of um, where a particular batch was collected from and in what way and how the cells were seeded and so on so that we have, and I'll give you uh, more information about that, we actually observe a couple of these nuisance factors directly. And that means that uh, we, first of all, actually have natural interventions on batch because we have different plates that we that are different batches and therefore we have natural interventions that we can leverage. That means we can actually measure um, the degree to which um, a particular batch has influence on our prediction here on Y, on, on predicting X, uh, Y from X. And we can then hopefully leverage the information that we have about these nuisance factors in order to learn invariances um, to this batch. Now, what do I mean we, we partially observe um, the batch? Um, normally, if you think about, how, we're now laying out the data set in a slightly different way, and we have here um, our different classes, so lots of cells from these particular patients here with controls, uh, other patients that have uh, peripheral neuropathy, and other patients that have mitochondrial DNA. And we typically, when we do bio biological experiments, we sort of think about intervening on this side of the biological hierarchy in which our cells relate to each other. However, in our case, we also have lots of information on the top here as to how these batches, how these data and how these batches relate to each other. For example, um, this data set number one that includes a couple of different cells here uh, was collected in a particular relationship to data set number two, which is they are on the same plate, but they were collected in different sections. And the sections here is this idea that we have a left and a right sort of on the plate that were collected independently. So these data set one and two come from the same section, um, from different sections, but from the same plate. Um, and data set three and four, similar relationship, but they relate to data set one and two because they are in different plates, but come from the same series. They come from the same thaw, if you will, of cells that we seeded into these plates. And so we have all this information um, available in sort of typical data collection processes. And so that means that we can, and, and I'm defining here um, these levels that I'm going to use later, because now we can actually check whether our, gen whether our, our um, features that we have learned generalize to um, these particular levels. So if we, if we for example, I'm going to skip this, if we, for example, uh, left out data sets two, four, and six, and eight, so we're leaving out particular sections, then we're gonna see whether we're generalizing, whether the features that we learn based on the data sets that we actually train on generalize well to these, um, to these left out data sets for, for, for the sections, for level one, which is uh, not so unlikely because you know, all the cells are the same, that it was just really seeded into different wells and the only difference is that we collected them at different time points. I see a question from Anne. Oh, oh yeah, how do I do this? Uh, minimize, hide names. Mm. Can I drag it? I don't think I can drag it. I think that must be a... Doesn't seem to respond to me. Hide floating me. There we go. That's it. Okay. So now we can see it better. Sorry for that. I didn't notice this. So in this case, we would leave out particular um, batches or, or sections, if you will, and then we can do this. We can sort of walk up the, the um, hierarchy uh, a little bit so we can leave out plates 
and see whether we generalize to left out plates. And then of course we can leave out series and see whether we generalize between series. And these are uh, increasingly ambitious sort of levels of generalization that we're trying to achieve. We can test this directly. We currently only collect data in our lab, so we can't assess whether you know, we generalize to data that would be collected in a different lab, but ideally that would also be possible. Um, now I'm gonna introduce a couple of different metrics that we're gonna to use to assess whether this is happening and, and how this is happening and how we're doing with in terms of batch effects and, and so on. Um, I mentioned before that we would like to um, have uh, a situation as, uh, as sort of illustrated here on the left, where we have classes. Classes are here, these symbols, and then we have, in this case, colors being the batches, where we have classes clustered together independent of the batch. Now, one of the scores that we're going to use in order to uh, sort of assess how our embeddings, our representations are looking like with respect to this effect is uh, what's called the Lysi score. Um, this is what was introduced actually by a group at, of, uh, at MIT that developed one of the methods that we're going to use to try and tackle batch effects. And this Lysi score uh, basically assesses the local neighborhood and, and looks at how many neighbors of a particular type are in your neighborhood. It says, okay, in this particular case here, we have um, only one type of batch in our neighborhood. So our score is going to be one. Here we have um, 1.5 on average batches in our neighborhood. So the Lysi score here is 1.5. And here again, we have one. So this is a bad situation because we have sort of pure batch neighborhoods. Um, we would like to have mixed batch neighborhoods because that would, that would suggest that we have a well-integrated representation and that's um, you know, sort of independent or invariant to the batch. Oh. So in this case, we have a, a better integration and that's great. But at the same time, we need to ensure that we also represent, we don't just integrate our data set and everything is sort of chaos, but we need to maintain um, the, the clusters that um, define the classes. So we calculate two different scores, the batch Lysi score, which we hope to be high, and then the class Lysi score, which we hope to be low because um, the the clusters here, or the clusters should only contain a particular class, so only one class in the neighborhood here. So that's a that's a score we're going to see again in our in our uh, in the following results. Then one way we can additional way in which we could potentially assess the extent to which we generalize is if we have a fixed representation, we don't do anything to the features, we get just get our representation. We can try and uh, run a cross validation experiment in which we leave out a particular batch and then see whether we can classify the validation data of that batch uh, using a KNN or an SVM or some sort of model that we use to classify things. And then in this particular scenario, I'm illustrating you a, a KNN, so we have our representation here, we have then leaving out the pink data set. Uh, its sort of densities are illustrated here. We, you know, this, this density was responsible for the stars and this was the triangles. And then we map the validation data onto this and we ask, can we classify it by its neighborhood? And in this particular scenario, we would classify all things that fall into this region here, probably as squares because they're close to these blue squares. And this, these guys, which actually should be classified as squares, they're now classified as stars because they're close to these stars. So that's an issue, right? But if we had a well-integrated data set over that is independent of the batch, this would work much better. Um, and then the final type of metric that I'm gonna focus on here is uh, one in which we actually run an end-to-end batch-wise cross-validation experiment, where we actually leave out everything and then we train a new model. We, we leave out a batch, we train a new model on everything, but that batch that we leave out and see whether that works well. So that's sort of the real experiment. The reason why we're looking at this, the, the middle column here, the middle row as well, is because training end-to-end -end batch-wise cross-validation experiments can get pretty laborious if you have large data sets. Um, and the idea for that we're going to apply here is that you know ideally we would try to see we learn a representation that doesn't see batch effects. You know, there are no batch effects. If you remember what Neo says in the scenario, is uh, there is no spoon and the spoon starts bending. So what we would like to see is there are no batch effects and maybe our representations bend in a way that uh, are now invariant from batches. That's my little metaphor here, maybe it works. We have developed a uniform framework to evaluate batch effect correction methods. And we're gonna explore two, three different approaches. One of which is maybe one thing we could do is to sort of post hoc correct our embeddings. We can maybe remove the batch impacts on these representations post hoc, uh, and then see that our, our uh, generalization generalization to new batches gets better. The second idea is that we could potentially do something during training, right? Normally we motivate our 
learning of the features just by training on one particular auxiliary task. So we distinguish the classes, but maybe we can do something more. Maybe we can also say, well, learn the classes, but do not learn the batches. That's sort of the idea for the second method. And the third method is something that I'm gonna get into a little more detail, which is one in which we um, actually work on the data uh, itself. So first method, uh, we're actually approaching, we're actually employing Symphony here. This is based on Harmony, which is a method that was developed for batch effect correction, the RNA -seq, single cell RNA seq world. And we said, well, you know, we have our features. Maybe we can just treat the features that we get out of our neural network as features the same way that RNA seq features are the reads sort of are used, and then see whether we can integrate um, those. Um, post hoc. So we have here a, a distribution in which we have strong batch effects. We have clustering by batch and subclustering by class. And the idea here is that we employ a method that estimates sort of a good correction um, for how to move, for, for how to regress out or for how to remove the batch effect from these representations, we do this iteratively, and then we hopefully get to um, a, a, a better situation where we now have clustering by the class and not so much by the batch. And we know that this seems to work pretty well, actually here evaluated by the LICE score that this paper also introduces uh, for single cell RNA-seq data sets where we are integrating um, the single cell RNA-seq data from, from two different data sets here. Um, in our scenario, well, things look pretty promising to begin with. So if we apply this to our data set, um, to our training distribution, we see that, wow, now we're really just clustering by uh, class and the batches seem as integrated as you could potentially hope for, right? However, there's a there's a problem when we look at the validation data, the IID validation data that we um, map and run. That, that if we inspect that, we see that actually there seems to still be a lot of structure according to the batch that is not so visible in the training in the training you map, but in, on valid it's sort of visually apparent even. And then we're mapping here the batch license score, which again we want to be high. Uh, against the batch lysis score of the validation set. And we see that actually, even though the trained the train batch lysis is higher, um, we're not really getting too much gain on the validation side. So um, we seem to have an issue with generalizing to even the IID validation uh, data here. And then on the, on the bottom, we're, we're mapping the batch lysis score, which again, we want to be high, over this, the class lysis score, which we want to be low. So everything is supposed to go to the right here against our KNN based uh, uh, batch cross validation uh, score. So that is leaving out one particular batch and evaluating the, the validation data on um, the, the rest of the reference. And we see that while we're moving a little bit, this is the movement of the validation uh, upwards here, we see a little bit of an improvement in this, this LICE score. We don't see much improvement even on our KNN based um, evaluation. And then if we actually do the full experiment, where we now actually leave out. Um, particular batches from the training of our models. And we, we then see whether we generalize to that. We see that there is really no difference between Symphony. So Symphony, Symphony and Baseline, Symphony does not help us generalize to uh, really out of distribution batches. And we're sort of breaking these scores up here into these maps where we have on the left, the baseline and on the right the column is the Symphony result. And we can see that everything's sort of the same. Um, so post hoc correction didn't seem very successful. Um, based on various evaluation methods, especially the last one. So now we're gonna see whether we can maybe do this thing where we say, well, we wanna learn the, the classes, but please don't learn anything about the batches. Ignore everything that has to do with the batches. And in order to do that, we're gonna regularize during training, if you will. So um, we're, we're borrowing an idea from Gannon and Lepitsky that introduced the idea of reverse gradient, gradient reversal layers, where now we set up our feature extractor here with our you know, normal heads and we have our class predictor. But at the same time, we're also gonna attach a second head that predicts the batch. And then, however, when we, on, on backdrop, when we, when we apply our gradients, we're gonna invert the gradient that we calculate with respect to the batch loss here. So that we're saying, if you learn something about the batch, well, you know, do the opposite, if, if you will. Like don't move your, features in that direction. Really don't see anything about the batch. Just look at the classes. Um, that's sort of saying, well, we want, a learning, we want to learn a representation that is independent and invariant to the batch because we don't extract any features that are relevant to the batch, but we still want to learn something about the class. Okay. Now we look at the results again. Um, I'm showing you here two different UMAP categorizations because one of the critical parameters, first of all, 
is this alpha value. You want to you want to grid search what value you, you should use here. If it's too high, you're going to just explode your, your curves. If it's too low, you're not going to do anything. So we grid searched that, and we found that for these two GRL scenarios, we, we found a good alpha score. And then I want to point out here that even though we get batch effect correction with this GRL model that has a very small head, so the head architecture here matters a little bit. We can actually get a nicer UMAP if we have a bigger head, a slightly more complicated head that allows a little more computation. I'm only mentioning this here because these UMAPs look so much nicer. Um, however, we're going to evaluate only this left part because that is the head that we usually use in all of our other experiments. So I, I thought I'd throw this in here sort of as an ablation or sort of a, a note because I feel like this, this, this method is, is very powerful potentially, even though, as you'll see, we're not quite there yet. Good thing is that comparing the, the, the Lysi scores between train and validation, we now seem to be uh, generalizing well there. However, if we, and, and then um, even, even if we look at our um, batch cross validation that is based on the KNN, we're seeing that these triangles, which are the GRL corrected, the radiant reversal layer corrected um, results, really yield quite an improvement based on both um, compared compared to, to um, the baseline here and compared to Symphony, we're doing much better, right? Um, however, again, if we actually run the full batch-wise cross-validation experiment on these various different levels, so section, leave out sections, leave out plates, leave out series, we see that again, we actually don't have any impact on the extent of generalization on this, um, on, in this experiment. Looks good if we just apply it to, to our embeddings, but if we train um, our models leaving out particular sections, plates, or series, and see whether we generalize to those, doesn't look good at all, right? We're, we're still basically having no impact. Um, so that seems kind of disappointing. Um, we're now gonna move to the third method, which of course is gonna have an impact, otherwise I wouldn't be talking here. Um, but I wanna ex explain a little bit and come back to our causal graph as to, as to what this method really is about. So I said before that ideally we would like to decorrelate Y from B and just represent the, rep, the, the, the correlation and hopefully the causal effect between X and Y. And we have this confounder B that really influences X, unfortunately. Um, if we had, if we were able to do great interventions, perfect interventions, we could potentially totally disconnect the confounder here from X, which would be great because then we could potentially learn a representation of, of X that is invariant to the batch. Now, unfortunately, we, as I said before, it's sort of hard to imagine or even think about how to do this type of intervention if we don't have good observations on B. I said we have, however, in our case, partial observations on B. And so we can think about how we can construct our data set um, in order to create a data set that is uncorrelated. And I'm showing you here a data set that is extremely correlated between the batch and the class. So in this case, we have you know, some cells here that are only from batch one, and then we have these types of cells that are only from batch two, these types of cells that are only from batch three. And that's not as extreme in our real data set, but this is sort of the the, a, a great thing, uh, thought, uh, a great idea, uh, great rip, the extreme case. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, now, what we can do potentially is we could, and that's what as humans we're really great at, is we can imagine what a particular X, what a particular cell would have looked like if it had been collected in a different data set. Um, ideally, we would find some sort of way to fill in this matrix. Um, so that we now have no correlation anymore between any particular cell type and the batch. Um, and therefore we would hopefully not learn any correlations or our, our um, feature representations would not be influenced by the batch anymore. Um, in order to do that, we um, developed a model that um, well, generates images such, uh, su such that we preserve the particular cell type or the particular phenotype, hopefully, while changing the batch statistics that surround it, if you will. So we're trying to disentangle really the component of X that is the features and the batches, and uh, therefore then apply that in order to generate new images um, that sort of construct the Gedanken experiment or the thought experiment that um, describes what would the cell have looked like if it had been collected in a different batch. Um, I can come back to, to these, this math a little bit if people are interested. I'm just going to move forward for now and explain to you what um, our method actually looks like. 
So this GST model, as we call it, generative style transfer model, is really a, a standard encoder decoder model where we have an input, uh, an image here, a, a source of batch one, and we have another image that comes from another batch. Um, and what we're gonna try to do is to, as I said before, have a prediction that preserves the X here, but now looks like it's coming from, the from another batch. Um, and then we're gonna feed in this prediction into uh, a new model that hopefully then will learn to become invariant to um, the batch. The way, the way we have constructed this is we, we have sort of a UNET architecture, if you will, with, with cross connections here. And in order to be able to learn a single model that can learn all the permutations of one batch into another, um, we are exploiting adaptive instance normalization layers that we now in the literature have seen uh, can be leveraged in order to sort of inject what particular target batch we would like to target at any particular forward pass. Um, and uh, what, what that yields is uh, a model that can do the following thing. So if we have here our original embeddings, um, little smaller embeddings than before, we're just visualizing, visualizing the batches here. We can set our model to generate images that look like they were collected from batch number three in this case, for example. So now all the data that we ran through our GSC model, setting it to generate images as if they had been collected from batch three, now indeed look like they were collected from batch three in the eye of our critic. And we can do this for all the different permutations. And the idea is now that we apply this uh, generate the GST generator as sort of an augmentation that we apply to the images so that we decorrelate the batch from the individual class. So during every forward pass, there is now no correlation anymore between the X and what X what batch this X was collected in. Therefore, complete correlate, the correlation is completely broken, hopefully, if we do a good job. And therefore, we should learn a, a, a classifier that um, is invariant to the batch. Now, I'm showing you here what these images actually look like. They look pretty realistic. So we have here the original X image, uh, the style image, actually. This is the style we want to target. This is batch number four, if you will. And this is the content image. OK, so this is um, what we want to preserve. And here's our prediction. And you can see that there are some differences between the prediction and the content image, the, the original X, um, even sort of visually, even though it's kind of hard to describe what exactly is going on. And I can't, I think I can't zoom in uh, with, with this setup here. But if we did zoom in, you would also notice that these images, even though they so, sort of look pretty realistic at low mag, if we don't zoom in, there are some, some, some clear signs that there are not even a human can look at these images and say like, oh, they're not perfectly the same as before. So we're doing a reasonably good job to approximate the Duncan experiment, the thought experiment here. We're not doing perfectly. I just want to point that out. It's sort of uh, still some work to do there. Now let's see what um, this method yields. We have here our original embeddings in the row here. So our classes and our batches. Uh, and now with these GST interventions, uh, we now get um, a much more harmonious, if you will, uh, embedding uh, representation in which really we have the feature, the classes define what the embedding looks like and the, the batches are, are pretty, pretty integrated based on this UMAP. Not perfectly, we have still have sort of an area there that isn't perfectly integrated, but it looks pretty good. Um, if we look at um, our X here, which is now the, the GST model, we see that train and ballot batch license score are on the, on the um, uh, relate linearly to each other, they, they move up together, they correlate well. And um, on our batch license, on our cross validation, KNN based cross validation uh, assessment, we see that the GST model is really um, getting pretty great uh, LICE and, uh, and uh, LICE scores. And we're also improving substantially over the baseline in this set. So everything looks good, but of course, the, 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 the full test is the end to end uh, batch wise cross-validation experiment. And now, amazingly, it seems like we have an effect. Um, so in, a, in our level one, which is the section, sort of the easiest way of uh, trying to all degeneralize, which is we have the same plate again. We just acquired two different areas of the plate at a different time. So it shouldn't be too hard to generalize over that, really. We're doing pretty well, but we're also doing pretty well at all the different levels here. So plate-wise cross-validation, major improvement really from I don't know, 10 or 15 um, average F1 score to let's go 50 maybe, so 0.5. And we can see this in the broken up 
um, matrices here. So a little more what these matrices actually are. When plotting here the F1 score for um, the classification task on this particular scenario, where we leave out one particular batch and map against everything else, and then we see whether we, we get a good classification score. So it looks good. <clears throat> In uh, summary, uh, we have evaluated a couple of different approaches um, in which we hopefully can tackle batch effects. And we're sort of summarizing this here, both with this table and then um, a graph here that matches the different levels of generalization that we hope to achieve against what we actually do on the batch-wise cross-validation in different scenarios. So um, we see here baseline-wise, if we exploit, if we, if we test this, we're dropping pretty rapidly if we do our batch-wise cross-validation, the end-to-end -end experiment. And none of the methods that we've uh, you know, evaluated, so the GRL method or Symphony, seem to help us very much in this true OOD generalization task where we learn features on only one subset and then we ask whether we can really generalize to a new scenario, which is a new batch or a new section or something else. Um, it's really only so far um, the GST model that seems to have a substantial improvement. And the improvement I'm pretty happy about, right? We're, we're moving from basically complete failure here or random guessing to something that is really much better than random guessing. And so I'm, I'm pretty happy about this. We see that, um, you know, if we map out the, the numbers here, we're really moving substantially up. We're not doing as well on the most challenging level of generalization, which is new series. Again, that is, we do the entire experiment again, we get some new plates and new cells and everything, we do it again. So that is clearly the most challenging thing, and we, we haven't fully um, tackled that yet. And then now on the bottom here, what I'm showing here, I should have added a little heading. We're actually comparing this to another data set, which many of the broad might be more familiar with, which is a cell painting data set, uh, the Lynx data set, from which Juan uh, extracted single cells and we created sort of a subset uh, of treatments. This is, a, this is a data set in which we treat uh, isogenic cell lines or uh, with, with certain pharmacological perturbations and we see whether things vary around and we would like to you know, represent these kinds of variations with a neural network. Um, the same way we, we've been working with uh, my data set so far. And um, we have identified that in this data set, when we learn and when we train models on this, we also have pretty strong batch effects, actually. We can't really assess level one, the section wise thing, because that doesn't exist in the setup of the data sets, but we can assess plate wise generalization and we can uh, assess series wise generalization. In this case, this would be a batch that was collected at a certain date and then another batch that was collected at a different date and so on. And we can see whether that generalizes as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the answer is that, especially at the level two here, I'm calling it, should be called level three. This is the highest level um, of generalization. We really, seem to fail completely, if you will. We're, we're at, um, let's see, 0.04 F1 score. Not, not great for baseline. But the same as before, the other methods don't seem to have much of an impact on, on this highest, on, on this real test. Uh, however, our GST model seems to help uh, improve the generalization to, to these OOD scenarios, to the level three uh, generalization. Uh, we also compare just for a sort of completeness, uh, the TVN approach that many of you may be familiar with on this particular data set. And we, we, we haven't um, fully assessed these, these, this full experiment here, but we have the KNN wise batch cross validation results. And it looks like the TVN actually hurts a little bit compared to our baseline. Um, this may be because uh, we're dealing with single cells and the TVN method was really developed for images that, were, that, that are larger fields of views with many cells. Um, uh, and, and so maybe the TVN isn't totally applicable in our scenario. It's another post-processing method uh, comparable to Symphony. All right, so this, these are the results that I wanted to discuss today. And uh, I wanna, again, uh, tell you a little bit about this as a last slide, sort of um, what we hope to be able to achieve now that we have some batch of that correction method. Uh, we're going back all the way to our application for why I started looking at this stuff. And that is that we now have a hopefully batch effect corrected uh, representation that is hopefully invariant to batches. And so now we might be able to evaluate new data such as new plates and actually hopefully then new patients. So here we see that new controls seem to map onto our controls pretty well, that's great. Here we have an RM1 patient that is the patient that we hadn't included in our data set. And this is sort of a new patient, not just a new batch, but a new patient. And looks like we're actually doing pretty well on recognizing 
this as an RM1 cell, as RM1 cells, and all these points are, again, individual cells or images. We get a little overlap with other landmarks, but that's okay. Um, and then we can hopefully apply this to something even more exciting, um, in which in this case we have, uh, we're looking at GUK1 cells that we had already represented in our um, experiment. And now we're gonna treat them with a drug that we had through orthogonal methods identified might have a beneficial effect on the defect that these GUK1 cells suffer from. And it looks like um, we're really reducing the number of cells that look convincingly like the GUK1 reference, where they look a little more like uh, control cells. So that's sort of the application that we want to pursue, both drug screenings and, of course, um, perturbing with uh, genetic interventions to test um, variants. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I want to really thank, in particular, again, Anne Carpenter. Uh, Juan, super thank you to you because you've been an incredible collaborator on, on all of this. And without you... Uh, the presentation would have been even worse, and uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to explain any of this stuff. Um, Michael has been a major contributor to um, this work as well, and then all of the other people at um, Columbia, uh, and of course, my funding sources. So I have a development grant that's actually now over from the MDA and a K99 that um, is still running. So thanks, and uh, please hit me with questions, and um, let's discuss what you guys think about the stuff. Hi, so oh, yeah. if I may yeah. ask a question, um, and maybe we can look at the architectural slide of your neural network, um, particularly the one where you tried the inverse gradient layers. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so that's a neat technique. I was just wondering why you didn't do something um, like, or, or maybe you tried it and it just didn't work, but more of a GAN type setup where you're trying to minimize the loss from the batch classifier, but then with respect to the parameters of the specific batch classifier, but then maximize the loss with respect to the parameters of the shared layers in order to try and decouple the two. Yeah, it's sort of similar, actually. You can really think of um, this branch here, the, the batch branch or the pink, pink branch as an adversary that is uh, you know, competing with the classifier that is trying to learn the class um, <clears throat> where, this, where, where we want to really maximize the loss on this part because we're inverting the gradient here and we want to minimize this loss. So this, this setup is actually sort of similar to the idea of an adversary of, of an adversary um, and and um, now what we what we could do is um, to what no in fact we're already doing this we are we're trying to you know this this classifier here is trying to do to be as good as possible in, in detecting the batch structure um, however on the backward path we are applying the gradient, and I should have pointed this out, only to the shared layers, as you as you say. Mm -hmm. The inverted gradient gets applied only to the shared layers, while this gradient is, uh, is applied to, to this classifier part. So we're only inverting the batch-related gradient on the shared mm -hmm. layers. No, it, it makes sense. I'm, I just, I'm not sure if it's mathematically equivalent. I'm not really familiar with this technique. I have to think about it. But um, if, it, if it wasn't, I just... You know, I wonder if you could use the GAN framework just because there's been so much work done on trying to make that work smoothly. But yeah, so with respect to your, to your GAN question, you know, our GST model is actually a bit of a GAN. Um, yeah, yeah. We have, you know, we're sort of exploiting the idea there, if you will. And it's mm -hmm. possible that there is some sort of intermediate between or a combination of these two methods that might work even better. Um, but I just wanted to point out, I haven't, didn't spend too much time on this, that we have here a critic um, that is um, yeah. really an adversary that learns to recognize, to distinguish on conditions on the batch, uh, whether a particular generated image comes from the target batch. So it's sort of a, a real image or a fake image that was generated. So we're passing real images from a particular batch through this critic, the same way you set up any, any GAN. And we're saying, is this a real image or a fake image? And when we're passing fake images through it, and we're saying, well, can you distinguish the two? So this, this is really your, your GAN component. 
sort of in a more, more canonical uh, setup. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had just one more question, and this yeah. should just quickly resolve. Um, for the very last slide, uh, let's see. Not the acknowledgement slide. <laughs> um, this guy yeah. or the one? No, the uh, applications. This um, one. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I was, and maybe I just misunderstood the slide. Are these the softmax probabilities of coming from a given class for these samples? And if so, why for, for example, the GUC1? Um, I mean, maybe the probability for that class looks like essentially zero. Um, is that a failure of the classifier? Um, let's see. So uh, what we're representing on the left is really the, the embeddings. These are collected from the penultimate layer before our softmax yes. um, for our classifier, right? So that's, that's on the left. And then on the right, these results are indeed the results of our classifier. So this runs through the softmax and we're getting the probabilities out there. We're then collecting the argmax off the output. And then we're seeing, you know, for how many images, what class sort of is predicted. Um, right. So now you were asking about GDAB one. Um, what is the question there specifically? Uh, I, no, sorry. The question specifically was for just GUC one. If, for example, if we look at that oh, GUK one, this this guy here. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. GUK one. Um, it looks like the classifier has correct uh, incorrectly classified that as KIF one A instead yeah. of GUC one. GUC one has like zero probability. Right. Uh, before the intervention. Yeah. Or before uh, adding that, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he, you're saying, oh yeah, that is that is uh, weird. That is misannotated. It should be uh, it should be GUK one. Okay. That sorry okay. That, that I didn't notice that. Good 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 catch. Um, but uh, you can see from the from the map here that um, these cells that the the GUK one maps here to to the GUK one group and and wild type. So that is a that is a mistake. Yeah, good catch. No, so yeah, the answer to your question is just a mistake in the, in the label that I generated here. Sorry. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, good presentation, by the way. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Can you mention your name? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Zach Alperstein. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> I have a related question. So if you go to your um, network, let's see, this guy here. Yeah, so which layer output is the like representations you're using for your UMAPs showing? Right, um, let's see, we can actually, if I can get the annotation back, no. So the UMAPs come from this penultimate layer here. It, not really in this network, but rather in the network that we train with <clears throat> our GST interventions. So it comes from this layer here, just the layer before the classifier. You could collect them earlier and you know some other layers and then see whether the representations, the UMAPs look a bit different or what they look like there. We have found that you know, collecting them from this part sort of just before we classify them gives us really in the end, just nice pictures because we gotta be careful about interpreting the UMAPs other than qualitatively. I do think that they're useful to look at because in the end, that's how we, for, that I first sort of noticed that there's something going on with the batches, that how, how I caught track, caught wind of batch effects and so on. And they help us think visually and they help us sort of conceptualize um, what an invariant uh, representation towards batches should look like. So that's why UMAPs I think are, are interesting to look at and they're nice to include, um, especially in the presentation. On the other hand, we should probably in developing methods and so on, primarily rely on um, quantitative metrics and evaluating those quantitative metrics in high dimensional feature space and the original feature space of these um, um, layers. And also, oh, go ahead. Now I wanted to ask some questions in the chat box. You can go ahead and I'm gonna ask. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Could you uh, transfer this slide from uh, one? Yeah, we, we you can really run it in a different in, in a couple different scenarios. Right? I, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat the question yeah. for the Zoom audience? It didn't quite come through the audio. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, I'm repeating the question. So the the question is how are, how are we actually using the GST model? One way, uh, you know, either you could project everything into 
Oh, actually, he wants to ask the question again himself. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, when you're going to align multiple batches, I guess you're choosing one batch so that you transfer all of the other batches, the style of the other batches to a reference batch, let's say. So my question is, how are you choosing that reference batch? You yeah, yeah. Batches? yeah. So very good question. That we, we could project everything into one batch, such as in this example. So here we have our GST and we're present, uh, projecting everything into batch three. And then, you know, ideally, you would, you would think, well, everything comes from the same batch now. Hence, we're not going to learn any correlations between batch and our label Y. However, we can also uh, project randomly any particular batch into any other batch, uh, any of these permutations, and train on that. And that is a little closer to um, this graphic here, where we're really filling in. We're imagining every possible um, scenario between our batches and um, the, the, the cells that we, that we have actually observed. And so we typically use this, we call that star mode, where we project everything into all the different directions. And the, the star idea comes from um, a paper that we took inspiration from here for, for this setup, Choi et al, that developed StarGAN version two, which is this um, uh, style transfer system that produces these wonderful images of you know moving a person that looks like a man into what looks like more like a woman and so on. These these more typical style transfer approaches. Um, so you can do both. Um, typically, we do the star mode, uh, and that seems to work well. Um, but you, you you could set it to one batch. I to be honest, I don't think we have def we have identified a major difference between these two setups in terms of performance. So a question in the chat box is that, uh, did you make your own LIMS to handle all of the samples tracking data lab labeling, or do you use a commercial product? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand uh, the question. Could you repeat it? Um, did you make your own LIMS to handle all of the sample tracking data labeling, like batches, labs, samples, or do you use it? So. Okay, I, what M I S M I N S L I N S? I'm not sure what it is. My own. Ah. Yes. So, but a, a nice question because I can I can uh, tell you how uh, heroic our data collection efforts are. Yeah, we don't have a robot, and um, <clears throat> we do everything by hand in some sense. Um, we have automated the data acquisition on the microscope that I mentioned before, which is this dedicated system that we usually use as cell biologists to collect this one nice image of, you know, or maybe 40 nice images of this one phenomenon, maybe with super resolution or so on. And we have sort of hacked the system so that we can automate collection over plates uh, so that the microscope, you know, does that automatically. So that part is automated. Um, the data preparation in the sense that we, you know, how the plates get made, we do that manually. So I sit in the tissue culture hood or whoever does the experiment sits in the tissue culture hood and pipettes cells where they need to go and so on. Um, so far, we're doing this manually. Um, and then finally, with respect to the experimental design, yeah, we, we created that ourselves. We, we thought it up. Um, we thought this particular setup of laying out the plates is... Uh, is, is particularly useful. So I'm showing you these, this plate layout again, where um, we are randomizing the wells in sections. We're having replicates of the actual wells in the separate section. So we don't have um, replicated uh, plate layouts. We, we have just the content sort of replicated. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're replicating the, the collection of individual data points across plates and then series. Um, so that's how we how we thought it makes makes a lot of sense, and it derives it, it delivers with it the uh, the these kinds of annotations that we can leverage in order to understand OOD generalization over different batches. Um, the fact that we have designed our experiments in this way really uh, means that we you know observe this this B here uh, at least partially. You know you you can there are actually more annotations as to the batch. So we, we know which well a cell comes from. And for each image, 
we actually have lots of metadata as to where the exact Z position of the objective was when that data point was collected and, and how long it took and what the laser intensities of the image was. So there's actually a, a whole ton of additional metadata that we could potentially exploit. Um, we have, however, found that these levels here that I'm describing here are, are sort of the major, um, where the major batch effects um, seem to manifest. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, one more. The metrics you use to evaluate the embeddings um, towards the end, they all seem to be local metrics, so like some variant on on a KNN. Have you tried to have you tried to use metrics that are um, how do I say more global metrics of the high dimensional embedding, like something like cross entropy or um, some type of topological to, to see if to see if the embedding in the high dimensional space is actually um, invariant across batches. Yeah, uh, no, we haven't we haven't explored that direction, uh, but it might be it might be a good idea to to develop a couple of more um, more global metrics, as you call them. In the end, though, I think the most important metric, and you know, uh, the the one that we really care about is the is the question of can we generalize when mm -hmm. we leave out a batch and we just train on the rest. Um, and so that is that is the most important metric um, in the end. So that's you know what's really coming out and let's see yeah, was, if we can get very their, their curves here. Um, so that that is what we care about in the end because that suggests that our model really doesn't care about batches and uh, really represents only class-wise variation. Yeah. But no, you're right. You know, maybe some other metrics could fill in, could be could be helpful in predicting whether any particular intervention or a system to correct batch effects will have this effect. Because as I mentioned before, calculating the real leave one batch out or leave one series out or whatever you want, cross-validation experiment can get pretty expensive because you have so many, potentially so many variate permutations of that. Uh, and so these other metrics that we've, we've used, um, they correlate a little bit, right? They don't correlate perfectly with um, what our end result, but we generally see that the higher Lysi score correlates with a higher F1 KN and batchwise correlation uh, 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 score, and and that typically then manifests some sort of improvement um, on the actual experiment. Even though um, really a, a large improvement we only observe for the GST uh, approach so far. Thanks. Um, yeah. I had a follow-up question very similar to his, so I'm going to try and tweak it. I'm just thinking about how you have thought, if at all, about generalizing to batches maybe beyond your own experiment uh, and that setup to maybe integrating other kind, other data from other labs and how you might think about, uh, or if you have thought about trying to find the boundaries on on how you can effectively detect the different types of batch effects that you can have because you've itemized and kind of mm. gone through what you think are the highest couple types of batch effects and those contributors but there's some broader way that you have you thought about a broader way to detect um, batch effects that would allow you to have a more effective way of, of integrating beyond one lab for example yeah yeah so that's a really good question um <clears throat> So there are a couple of different ways we can think about that. Within the experiment, in our case, for most machine learning applications so far, I mean you have to have the same data collection setup, which means you have to have the same protocol. Um, that is, our protocol is different from cell painting, for example. So it's not going to be immediately obvious how to integrate those two things. There are, I'm sure there are ways for it, and I have a couple of ideas, but so far, um, that's not really something we are actively pursuing. Um, but of course we could, you know, and I have this in this hierarchy, we could, you know, if, if the Broad has a similar microscope as the one we're using, we can just use the same staining protocol, the same way of preparing the plates and so on. And then uh, we could potentially assess the lab wise batch effect if you want, you know, for that, that, that actually means you have to collect data though. And so you have to actually do it somewhere else physically. We can't just simulate that because we actually don't observe currently whatever that batch effect might be. 
which is sort of an interesting thought. Like we, you know, the fact that we have these interventions, which is take a plate, take another plate, that's an intervention on the batch, right? The fact that we have those means we can observe what effect that has and we can develop methods around it. There are other methods to, um, to try and intervene on this batch or this nuisance variation, more generally we call it, which uh, one particularly inspiring paper for us too comes from Carl Vondrick's lab uh, at, at Columbia. And what he does is in ImageNet, he says, well, you know, we only have certain viewpoints of say your ladle or your, your, your table. And, you know, we would like to learn a representation that doesn't care which particular viewpoint a table was collected at. It's still a table if I look at it from the other way. Um, but he doesn't, you know, the annotations as to the viewpoint are not available. So what do we do then? He suggests that we can steer a generative network along its principal components uh, of the representations to sort of move into one direction and the other direction because we, we, uh, we, we noticed that a lot of the larger generative models actually inherently represent these nuisance directions um, in, their in their feature spaces. So we can move along those directions and then hopefully generate interventions that are useful to decouple the nuisance factors from our XY mapping, even though we can't really guarantee that that's gonna be complete, we can get much closer to a guarantee that our interventions over a particular subset of the batch effects here are complete because we know, we, we observe what these batch effects are. We have labels for them, right? We know what batch one is and batch two. So we can fill in that matrix that I've shown you before, sort of very explicitly. Um, we don't observe the lab yet, but we could use something like Vondrick proposes moving along the PCAs of a generative network to create those interventions also. So maybe that helps. That would be very useful in thinking about you know, expanding your data sets. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. Next steps. All right. Any other questions? Actually, I have a fundamental question about the representations you are learning here. So the final goal is to extract these representations that, um, that are independent of batches and can be distinguishable for different classes. Um, so is it everything you want? Because I think depending on the next application, you have to somehow validate your representations to be, you know, powerful enough to do the next thing. It's not just enough to, you know, be different for different classes, right? Absolutely. No, you're, you're completely right. The, um, this talk and the work that I've presented today really concerns itself with how can we correlate, how can we decorrelate the batches from whatever else we get, right? Um, and that's already pretty tricky. And, you know, it took a lot of work to get to a point where that seems to be somewhat feasible. So in that sense, we have been testing whether our, um, our representations are general by intervening on the top column here, on the, on the columns, if you will. But of course, in the end, what we want to use these systems for is to interpret interventions on the rows. We want to see whether when we treat this particular patient here with some drug, whether that um, you know, has it has an effect, or maybe maybe in a little more concrete example. Let's say we know, let's say we know what gene causes patient one's disease. It's MFN two. There's a mutation there. Now, a good intervention on the phenotype that we don't really know exists, but that we're trying to learn, right, is to see whether the representation we get of that patient is actually causal with respect to the genetics that underlie, we think, the phenotype that we map to Y, is we need to intervene on the phenotype. That means maybe most concretely, since we can't move mitochondria around physically, we would intervene on the genetics. So we would you know, correct potentially the mutation and see whether in the same context, the same cell, after we corrected the mutation that we think is responsible for the phenotype, we now get a mapping to the control. Um, so that's, that's actually the, the application that originally motivated this work that got us started, which is, can we apply this in diagnostics, right? Uh, the hypothesis, this gene causes the disease and 
our phenotype that we are observing, we can test that by intervening on that particular genetic variant. So that's what we need to get to. But in order to get to that, I think we first, or as well, need to really handle these batch effects because otherwise we can't grow data sets and learn representations that would allow this sort of thing at all. We would always be confounded and we couldn't, we couldn't convince any biologists that what we're doing is, is uh, you know, reasonable and, and useful. Thanks. Thank you for the great work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.